Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Today, I'm going to be delivering a very, very serious message about how Satan can get an advantage in your life, how he can get a foothold in your life, and how it can destroy you. And how you can live in defeat instead of victory. Because God has given you a spirit of being a conqueror. The word of God itself says we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. There's no reason for you to live in despair and discouragement and fear. There's just simply no reason for it. And I'm going to show you two or three reasons that's found in God's Word. Because you need to understand something. You really need to understand something. The first step that you're going to take toward a downward spiral as a believer, not a lost person, but as a believer, is when you get into a discussion with the devil because the devil will always lie to you. The devil will never tell you the truth. He'll always lie to you. And you get into a discussion with the devil, you're going to lose. And sometimes Satan is so subtle, so very subtle, and what he says makes so much sense that you're tempted to believe it. And if you do believe it, you're caught in his trap. So you don't want that to happen. And you need to understand that if during times in your life that are very difficult times, and all of us face them, if suddenly you begin to have thoughts that are just too reasonable, make too much sense, be very, very careful because those thoughts may be coming from the devil to keep you from being victorious. Now let me explain that from my own life. Now, and, and remember what I said to you. Satan wants you not to be victorious in your Christian life. He wants you to be defeated. He wants you to be discouraged. Because if you're defeated and if you're discouraged, you're not going to have the faith in God that is yours to enjoy. So the goal of Satan for the believer, he can't keep you from going to heaven. That's already settled. You're not going to hell. You're going to heaven. But he's going to make you miserable, make you live a life of defeat, of giving up, and of not trusting God. And remember, let me reiterate, when you're going through some tough times and you begin to have thoughts that are counter to what you really believe God wants you to do. But these thoughts run counter and make too much sense. Those thoughts may be from the devil. And I'll give you an example of that. What I'm about to share is from my own life. And those of you that attend Sun Baptist Church as well as a few other places, you know some of this. You don't know all of it. And I can't tell you everything because I wouldn't have time in this message. But I was born with a genetic blood disease, and it's a very bad one. It's called von Willebrand's disease. It's very, very similar to another bleeder's disease, hemophilia, but it is not hemophilia. Von Willebrand's disease is not a really rare disease. Many people have it. The hematologist, the blood specialist, will tell you there are three stages for those who have Von Willebrand's disease. Stage one is when a person has Von Willebrand's, but it's not really serious. They may bruise a little bit more, or if they cut themselves, it may take just a little bit longer for it to clot. Phase two is when they may have a little difficulty with procedures such as having a tooth pulled, there might be more blood involved in it than usual and have to take some extra precaution. They may bruise really easily with a more intense bruising or coloration. 
Stage three is the most serious, and that's when people can die from it. Operations are avoided or proceeded upon with great caution. And generally, these people are unable to live a normal life. But they must stay at home and regularly have infusions at the hospital. And that's the worst of the three stages. The hematologists have told me that I have a stage that's even worse. That I am the only person they know that's not included in one of those three stages that has von Wilbrand's disease. I'm the only one. Everyone else bled to death a long time ago. And those who are born with it live only two or three years, if that long. And it's constant bleeding, and then they finally bleed to death. But here I am, an adult man. Now, why did that happen? Why did that happen? One cardiologist, not a hematologist, not a blood specialist, from Baylor University was present when I was speaking at a conference. But for some reason, he had been studying von Willebrand's, though it wasn't in his field. And he came up and we had a discussion, and as a result of that discussion, he said, you are the only person with this severe form of von Willebrand's, even though you're in a stage by yourself. Those in stage three simply don't have the optimism about life that you have. Because they bleed so much, they've just given up. They've just given up. But you haven't. Why? It would seem to me, he said, it would only stand to reason that you would be staying at home, not driving, not flying, not going outside the country, not living a full energetic life. Why are you so optimistic? And, of course, I had to go back to my mother and share with him that my mother was a very godly woman. And during those times as a child when I would be bleeding to death, literally bleeding to death, it seemed, and then I would miraculously finally recover, my mother would tell me, Son, don't be afraid. You cannot die. Satan cannot kill you. As long as you keep your eyes on God, you can't die until God has completed in your life whatever he puts you here on earth to do. You can't die. Don't be afraid. See, with the things that happened to me, it would stand to reason. Remember what I said. If it sounds too reasonable, it may be a ploy of the devil. It would only stand to reason with this terrible blood disease. That if someone said, I'd live in a room that had nothing but mattresses on the wall, and I'd walk around encased in pillows, and I wouldn't go anywhere. But I live a virtually normal life. Because I'm not going to let the devil's lies destroy the victory that God has for me. Because that's what he's wanting to do. See, I was born with this blood disease. And they knew they had a problem because they had to tie off the umbilical cord three times to keep me from bleeding to death. And all of my life I've had major bleeding episodes. One that I can remember was because of my stupidity. When I was a little fellow of five years of age, a little neighborhood friend of mine, a good friend of mine by the name of Buddy Kern, same age as me, we were both playing in the leaves. My father had raked leaves in the front yard because of the fall of the year. And I crawled under the leaves, covered myself up, and I had been reading the day before some comic books about Superman. So I said to my little buddy, take a rake and hit these leaves. It won't hurt me. And here I am a bleeder. <laughs> well, he hit my knee, but not with a, rather, with a regular leaf rake, but a garden rake, and that's a lot worse. And I nearly bled to death. When I was seven years of age, 
because of strep throat, I caught rheumatic fever. As a result of that, the aortic valve in my heart was damaged. And right in the middle of all of that, I began to bleed profusely through the nose. I can remember my mother taking a wash pan while we waited for old Dr. Shipley to come at midnight. And he would pack my nose two or three times, had to do it to stop the bleeding, and it finally stopped. But she'd take that dishpan while we were waiting, and the blood from my nose would fill that dishpan. And I remember going out on the back porch and her throwing the blood out in the yard and bringing it back. And during that time that I was seven years of age, I remember lying on a cot in the backyard and blood still trickling from my nose. And I was lying on a cot. My mother was making kraut in an old churn out of the vegetables in our garden. And I was so weak I couldn't even raise up to eat. And somebody had given me a Viewmaster. Do you remember the Viewmasters? They looked like binoculars and you'd put a little round disc with beautiful pictures and there were some beautiful pictures of Hawaii and you'd pull a tab and the little disc would go to the next picture. But I was hurting so bad from the rheumatic fever and weak from bleeding, I couldn't even pull the tab down. Somebody else had to do it. And so there were times I bled. The most dramatic time was when I was a senior in high school, 18 years of age. And it was Christmas break, and I went out into a field with some neighborhood friends, and we played football, and I caught the ball and fell, stumbled and fell. And another boy inadvertently didn't mean to, but he landed on me, and his knee went into my abdomen. And the next day, my left leg was totally paralyzed. They finally decided I had cancer in the abdomen, did exploratory surgery. What they found was a massive blood clot crushing the nerve to my left leg. And when they took that clot out, I wouldn't quit bleeding. And I bled 122 pints in eight days. And I remember on an occasion completing a great crusade down in Collins, Mississippi. On the day after, I was drinking coffee in the motel with the owner of the motel. And I began to gush blood. So I called the blood specialist. What should I do? He said, how near is the closest major hospital? I said, an hour and 15 minutes. He said, you know, Harold, you and I have always been honest with each other. You're probably not going to make it. Obviously, I did. On another time, not all that long ago, I fell, had a concussion again a concern about bleeding. Another time not long ago, I had to have a colonoscopy. It discovered I had some polyps that were pre-malignant. They had to be removed, which meant cutting. So they loaded me down with humate P. Humate P is a clotting factor. A dose is the size of a bottle of Coke and cost $80,000. Thank God for good insurance. If I have a tooth pull, I have to have four of them. That's $320,000. I had to have heart surgery to repair that valve from the rheumatic fever. One and a half million dollars for that. But after that colonoscopy, we thought it was not bleeding. They'd given me a lot of that humate tea. Marilyn and I left the hospital, stopped to eat lunch at a restaurant, and I began to feel weak. And I said, wait for the food. We'll take it home. I'm going to the car. When I sat down, I inadvertently locked the car and began to gush blood through the cold. So this is a continual bleed. Now, reasonably speaking, people who love me, knowing that I have this condition, have insisted out of love that I quit pastoring a church, that I quit evangelism, that I quit preaching that I take care of myself. And I know they love me. I know they did. But that was the devil. The devil, through good words, reasonable words. That's the reason I said be careful. If it sounds too reasonable, it may be the devil trying to stop you. 
I mean, you and I love the Lord and the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. If we had been there out of love, we would have said to Jesus, we're going to drag you out of this garden. We're not going to let them kill you. You're too good. But you see, that would have been an obstruction to the mission of Jesus Christ. He came to the earth to die for us. So you need to be careful in your life. If you really want to serve God, you better be careful. Satan will use the words and influences of other people to try to stop you. Let, let me give you some examples of how three examples that my mother warned me about. And that's the reason I've been able to continue in my ministry. She warned me ahead of time and that whole time growing up or I would have quit a long time ago. I would have quit a long time ago. I would have been like those with Von Wilbrand's disease in stage three, and I'm even worse than they are. But I would have given them every reason in the world that they ought to stay at home, take care of themselves. And here I've gone all over the world. But it was Satan trying to stop my ministry, and he'll try to stop you, and try to stop you from having victory. Now, let's look at some passages. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. And look at verse 11. Lest Satan, underline lest, lest Satan should get an advantage of us or get an advantage of me. Now what's Paul saying here? Number one, in order to keep Satan by reasonable argument, to keep Satan from having an open door in your life and getting control in your life, you need to be aware that he will try to get you involved in continual sin, in continual disobedience. God has commanded that we forgive people. Now, remember, I've said it before. Forgiveness in the Bible means the person that has done wrong must come and repent and ask forgiveness or forgiveness cannot take place. Now, the innocent party may be willing to forgive, but he can't really biblically forgive. Well, now, how do I know that? Because even Jesus at Calvary died that all men and women everywhere could be saved. But we know that a lot are going to go to hell. Why? Because he also said in Luke 13, 3, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. In order to have biblical forgiveness, the one that did the wrong must come and ask forgiveness. Now, if they do, we're under a command, we're under a mandate to forgive them, whether we want to or not. And listen, Satan will give us all sorts of reasons not to forgive them. You know one of them? And I hear it a lot. Well, you just don't know how bad they were. You don't know what awful thing. You don't know how horrible they were. It may be. It may be the worst of sins. But if they come and say, forgive me, you've got to forgive them. Yeah, but it was so bad. Let me tell you something profound. Are you ready? You don't ever have to forgive somebody for doing good. Of course it was bad. That's the reason forgiveness is needed. So you have to forgive them if they come. See, I'm not going to heap guilt, for example, on the young, some young lady that has been brutally beaten and raped by some thug. Oh, darling, you just got to forgive them. How can she do that until he comes and admits it? All you're doing is placing guilt on her. Saying if you're the Christian, you ought to be, you ought to forgive. When she's having difficulty just getting up in the morning. Now she ought to be open to forgiveness. We all must be open to forgiveness. But there is something else to be said. Listen, Satan is sly. Listen at this. Are you listening? Listen. Satan will do everything that he can according to this passage here to keep you from forgiving that person. They've come, but you're not about to forgive them. He'll do everything he can. But then you turn around and forgive them. Does he walk away? No, he doesn't walk away. 
he takes another attack. Once you forgive them, and Satan's ploy to keep you from forgiving them has been thwarted, now what Satan does is brag on you. Yeah, he'll brag on you. Oh, aren't you a great Christian? Nobody else would have done what you do. You're such a wonderful person. Now you know what you've done. If you're not careful, now you've gone from a spirit of unforgiveness, which gives Satan an opening into your life, to the place of pride at look at what a great Christian I am, and that allows Satan an open door into your life. <laughs> Isn't that wild? So number one, continual sin and trying to justify it will give Satan an open door and keep you from having victory. The second thing are the very words you say. Would you turn with me over to Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21? I'll give you a moment to find it. Proverbs 18 and verse 21. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now what in the world does that mean? Death and life. You're going to speak one of two things. Say it this way. Positive or negative, righteousness or sin, good or bad, light or darkness. What's it going to be? Because everything you say is going to have some sort of production. Do you remember in Hebrews chapter 3, Jesus is called the high priest of our profession. Some translations say confession. In other words, Jesus is the high priest of what we say. Are you listening? Are you listening? The high priest would take what others had given him and take it to God, and God would bless the things that he brought from other people. In Hebrews 3, it literally is saying, Jesus takes what we say before the Father. Now, he can't bless negativism, and he can't bless words of sin. That's the reason your words ought to be moral and uplifting and positive, and God will bless those words and make them happen in your life. But on the other hand, if you speak negativism and criticism and gossip, the demons will take those to Satan and Satan will use them as a curse. That's the reason the Bible says life and death is in the tongue. Let me give you another passage. Proverbs 6, 2. Since we're there. Isn't this good? It's good, isn't it? Proverbs 6 and verse 2. And let's see what the Bible says here. Get my Bible to open up where it ought to. Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Now, what's a snare? That is a hidden trap for small animals. And I'm going to tell you something. You're out here and you just say something. You don't think it amounts to anything. But it's negative. And it's not godly. And it's not scriptural. And you'll end up trapping yourself. And the reason you're going to trap yourself is the very thing I said a while ago. The high priest, Jesus, according to Hebrews 3, can only take those things that are good and positive and noble that come out of your lips for God to bless. And if you start talking these others, you're going to trap yourself with the devil. Now, I've really got a good passage coming up here. Are you ready for a really good passage? Now, I mean, this is a good one. Turn to Numbers chapter 30. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers chapter 30. Numbers chapter 30. And we're going to look beginning at verse 1. Now listen, this is really, really good. This is going to be eye-opening to you. It's going to change your life. I'll bet you've never seen it. And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, 
he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. So words are very important. That's what God is saying here. What comes out of your mouth is very important. You know, you'll hear somebody say, well, I didn't mean anything by it. Well, you shouldn't have said it. If, now watch this, verse 3. If a woman also vow thou unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond. Now watch this. Being in her father's house and her youth. In other words, she's a young lady still at home. What does this mean? Her father has spiritual authority over her, and mother as well. But here's talking about a father. Verse 4, and her father hear her vow, and her bond wherewith she hath bond, bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her. Then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. In other words, she's made a vow, the father overheard it, he didn't think it was a very wise vow, but he didn't do anything about it. Then she's going to have to pay for that vow. Verse 5. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. And the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. What does that mean? The father heard this vow that wasn't a good vow. He simply went to God and said, I'm not going to allow it because he had spiritual authority over it. Now gather with me. The Word of God says, God is the head of Christ. The Father is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the husband. The husband is the head of the mother or the wife. And the wife is the head of the children. So the wife has spiritual authority over the children just like the husband does. But the husband has spiritual authority over the wife. Now what does all this mean? It has to do with the power of words, folks. Come on. It has to do with the power of words. And words have power. Let's say a little boy comes in from school, a little second grader, made a D in reading. I'm the dumbest boy that ever lived. I'm an idiot. The mom takes spiritual authority and says, don't you ever say that again. Words have power. Don't you ever say that again. You're not an idiot. You're not an idiot. I'm not going to allow you to say that. You're brilliant. You're God's child. We trust God around this house. God's going to make something great out of you. And you break that vow. Peter the Lord, and I've said this before, the great man of God, Talked about eulogizing people. We ordinarily think of eulogizing when something good is said over a dead person. But eulogize means to say a good word. And he said you ought to say it over people that are alive. I mean, your child comes and says, I'm stupid. Don't you ever use that word. Or a sister says about her brother, Johnny is stupid. Don't you ever say that word. My mother never allowed that in our house. Words have significance. And and you that are in spiritual authority, you have the power to break those words that are said by those who are under your authority. That's very important for parents to know. That's important for husbands to know. Because if you look at verse 7 of Numbers chapter 30, start with verse 6. And if she had at all an husband when she vowed or uttered aught out of her lips, wherewith she bound her soul. And her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it. Then her vow shall stand and her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband disallowed her on the day he heard it, then he shall make her vow which she vowed and that which she uttered with her lips wherewith she bound her soul of none effect. See, we're in a spiritual war and your words can give Satan an open door. You listen to children keep talking negatively about themselves or parents talking negatively about their children and they'll end up being that. That's what they'll end up being. God deliver us from the power of words that can bond us. And those of us in spiritual authority, those of you that are pastors, you have spiritual authority there at your church. Somebody comes along and they start 
speaking negative words about another member. You say, now wait a minute right there. I'm going to stop that. We don't do that here. I break that vow. I break that word of gossip. I'm not going to listen to it. I had a woman one time say to me, I don't know why people always come to me about all the bad stuff at church. I said, I can tell you why they come. Everybody knows where the city dump is. You need, if you're in spiritual authority, stop the power of words. So, continual sin will give the devil an open door. Words that are not challenged, that are negative, will give an open door. But then there is something else, and I'll be very quick about it. Turn to Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. For as he thinketh in his heart, thoughts will give the devil an open door. Be careful what you think. Be careful what you think even before you say it. Be careful. You need to be thinking Paul says about the things that are good and noble and moral and upright and not the dirty and the sordid and the evil. Think the good things. Let me tell you something that I think is very profound. The Bible says the truth will set you free. Is that right? The truth will set you free. If the truth will set you free, lie will imprison you. Truth and lie. The truth will set you free. The lie will ultimately, will ultimately bind you. And let me tell you something about the devil. It's very, it's very cynical. He wants to have a conversation with you. And he wants you to think reasonably. He first did that on Eve in the Garden of Eden. Basically, in the Hunter version of Genesis chapter 3, the opening conversation, he walks up to Eve and said, Well, Eve, what do you think about what God has said to you about what is going on in the garden? He didn't say anything good. He didn't say anything bad. Now, Eve quoted God pretty well right. She said, Well, God said, We need of any tree. It must have been thousands. That's very positive from God. You can eat from thousands, but if you eat one, you'll die. Here's where Satan comes back in the conversation with an outright lie. You're not going to die. Now, why would he say that? Because he was appealing deep. Eve had never committed a sin, never said a bad word, never done an ungodly thing, never had a bad thought. You're too good a person for God to kill you, I think is what Satan was saying. She entered into a conversation. Say, so you're not going to live in this thousand, thousands, and thousands of trees in this garden. One little bite off a piece of fruit, he's not going to kill you. That doesn't even make sense about God. God's too loving a to God. I can just see Satan doing that. Now, let me tell you, when it's too reasonable, you better check it out. It may be of the devil. It would have been too reasonable for Jesus, who had never committed a sin, never done anything wrong, to leave the Garden of Eden and uh, leave the Garden of Gethsemane rather and save his life. That's reasonable, but it would have been wrong. It would have been reasonable because of my blood disease, and the fact that I'm the only one living with it, and I could bleed to death in any minute. To be sitting home in a rocking chair for the rest of my life watching as the world turns or whatever, and doing nothing. That was reasonable, but it would have been wrong. Don't let your words give Satan an open door. Don't let continual rebellion against God give Satan an open door. I don't care what's going on in your life, and don't let thoughts in your mind give Satan an open door. My mama told me that, and it worked. So this year I'm celebrating 60 years in the ministry. If I had listened to the reasonable words of the Satan from people who love me, I would have never celebrated the first year. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen.